You're watching Reason and Theology Live. The show concentrates on theological topics, historical matters, and philosophical problems with content ranging from introductory material to in-depth examinations. And now, your host, Michael Lofton. Welcome to Reason and Theology, everyone. Your host, Michael, on a Saturday afternoon here. We are doing a webinar on Byzantine Catholicism. Ask any question that you have about Byzantine Catholicism. And we are joined by the very Reverend Proto-Presbyter Father Elias Rafai, who is, again, the Proto-Presbyter in the Byzantine Catholic Church for the Arch uh, Archieparchy of Pittsburgh. Father Elias, welcome to the show. How are you? Thank you. I'm very well. Happy to be here. Honored to have you on. I'm really excited about this. So, you know, the, the format, as we, we spoke off the air, uh, we'll do about 30 minutes of a presentation on, you know, introducing us to Byzantine Catholicism, especially for those who aren't uh, aware of what it is. And then after that, we're going to take live chat questions and also live phone calls. So um, don't don't start calling yet, though. <laughs> um, I, I will give you all the phone number when it comes uh, time. So in about 30 minutes. So if you already have the 800 number, don't don't call it just yet because I won't be able to answer. But when I open up the lines, I will put the number on the screen. You can call and I'll uh, do do my best to, to get to you. And um, same for your questions that you'll put in the live chat. If you could maybe just hold off on those, because again, 30 minutes from now, if you post your question right now, I probably, probably I'm not going to see it 30 minutes from now. So um, post it maybe in about 25 minutes uh, from now, and then we can start getting to those chat questions. And again, it's ask anything about Byzantine Catholicism here with Father uh, Elias. So, all right, well, Father Elias, um, now that we have the introductions, uh, you know, out of the way, if you want, um, take, take it away. Tell us a little bit about Byzantine Catholicism. What should we know? Okay, well, I think we should start with prayer. Mm -hmm. um, this Sunday, tomorrow, we observe the Feast of the Three Holy Hierarchs, uh, who are uh, doctors of the Universal Church, but also mm -hmm. for the um, Eastern Churches, especially those of the Byzantine tradition, uh, they are foundational. And they are uh, Saint Basil the Great, who is the patron saint of this church behind me, my parish, uh, Saint Gregory the Theologian, also known as Gregory of Nazianzen, and St. John Chrysostom. And so we'll begin uh, with their Traparian and Kentakian as our opening prayer. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Teachers of the world, of one mind with the apostles, intercede with the Lord of all to grant peace to the world and abundant mercy to our souls. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and ever and forever. Amen. Lord, you have received your holy and inspired preachers, the foremost of teachers, into the enjoyment of your good gifts and repose. You preferred their labors and death above any other sacrifice. For you alone glorify your saints. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. So, what can I say in a half hour about uh, Byzantine Catholicism? Um, I think, firstly, um, we have to kind of go back to the origin. So um, just with the name Byzantine, uh, the name would probably horrify most of the fathers of the early Greek church uh, because Byzant Byzantine is based on Byzantian which was the uh, pre-Christian name of the port city where Constantinople was eventually built. And uh, it was a very uh, politically, uh, strategically well-placed location between uh, the Black Sea and the Mediterranean Sea. And Constantine, uh, when he began to, when he legalized Christianity and began to uh, offer his support to the growth of Christianity uh, because of especially the, the intercession of his mother, St. Helena, uh, Constantine, who was 
greatly criticized in Rome by the noble families, uh, the patricians who were there, uh, decided to create a co-capital to rule over this entire huge, uh, vast empire, the Roman Empire. Uh, but there was also, uh, I would say, a personal reason for that. I think in Rome at that time, he realized that he could not fight against the well-established senatorial uh, families uh, and the well-to-do. And so by creating a Christian capital, uh, it would make the conversion of the entire empire to a certain degree easier. And, and also the fact that the uh, Roman populace who disliked uh, many of the well-established and well-to-do uh, disliked Christianity because they saw it as a weak religion and um, they found it was easier, easier to control the pagan Romans through their own religious tradition, which came through the Greeks. They also were very uh, gossipy and they insinuated that Constantine was not a uh, legitimate ruler, nor was he uh, a legitimate uh, son of his father who had uh, ruled previously. And they insinuated that uh, Helena was a prostitute. And so I think Constantine took that personally and, um, and took, took the whole empire to Constantinople, which, of course, you know, it was, used to be Byzantium. Then he named it, uh, in all humility, after himself. Uh, so in the year 324, Constantinople was founded. Uh, it became the city associated with the Greek language, uh, with Greek uh, tradition, liturgically speaking, and uh, Greek spirituality. The, um, so Byzantine comes from that. We say Byzantine rite or Byzantine liturgical tradition, but uh, it is, in English at least, it, it is kind of representative of that pre-Christian phase. So it should actually be Constantinopolitan Catholic. Now that rolls right off the tongue. And so that's why it was Byzantine. Um, in uh, many countries, such as in the Middle East, as well as in Eastern Europe, another title is still used, and that is Greek Catholic. And, uh, and that is more focused on the uh, language and the background culture. So by saying Greek Catholic, we're still saying Constantinopolitan Catholic or Byzantine Catholic. So that is where our church found, uh, finds its roots and foundation. Uh, the liturgical tradition of Rome and Constantinople was essentially the same for those first couple of centuries even. And some, some traditions that we find as being completely Western, for example, like the use of an organ in the church, uh, was something that was also done in Constantinople. And actually the first organ that was uh, um, installed at St. Peter's Basilica, the original basilica, uh, was a gift of the royal court of Constantinople. And uh, so liturgically speaking, there was a connectedness because the people who were the, um, um, the well-educated nobility of the Roman Empire, uh, they considered themselves to be uh, the heirs of the Greek culture. And many of them who were well-educated were educated in the Greek tradition and the Greek language. And so even in Rome itself, the nobility amongst themselves very often spoke Greek. And in Rome, the first liturgical tradition um, 
uh, was connected to the Greek language. Latin came then from that. And a remnant in the Roman mass of that is the singing of the Kyrie eleison, which is not Latin and is actually Greek. Hmm. Um, our church, so when we talk about Byzantine Catholicism, we're talking about a family of churches that follow the liturgical traditions, the calendar of saints, um, and some the, even the musical tradition of the Church of Constantinople, also known as the Great Church. And uh, however, these different churches, some are Orthodox, some are Catholic, uh, they have differences in uh, language and culture and even in history, but it's, it's all founded on Christianity from Constantinople. Uh, for us, the Greek language, we could say, is kind of the, uh, the first language of our church, uh, even though um, we have a number of um, other languages that are used. Uh, one of the things, one of the questions that, that I often uh, get is, uh, you know, when do we have liturgy in Greek? Well, uh, you know, the attachment to Greek is not quite like in the Roman church, the attachment to Latin. In the East, uh, the tradition was always to translate uh, everything into the language of the people so that they could understand. And, uh, and so this is where uh, my church, my church is a Byzantine Catholic church, just like the Roman Catholic, uh, Romanian Catholic church, the Melkite Greek Catholic church, the Ukrainian Greek Catholic church, uh, and many other churches that follow the same liturgical tradition of Constantinople. We're all Byzantine Catholics, which means we are in full communion with the church of Rome or the Roman Catholic Church, through the person of the Pope specifically. So those churches which are Byzantine but not Catholic are the Eastern Orthodox churches. And those are the churches such as the Greek Orthodox Church, the Church of Constantinople, uh, the ancient patriarchates of uh, Antioch, Jerusalem, and Alexandria, uh, Russia, which we're hearing a lot about these days, uh, Serbia, Yugoslavia, Bulgaria, Romania, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. There are quite a few. Um, and these churches, the Eastern Orthodox churches, are all in communion with each other. And uh, then the Byzantine Catholic churches, uh, they all also have their own history with Rome in communion with Rome. My church is referred to also as the Ruthenian Byzantine Catholic Church. And, uh, and Ruthenian is a little bit uh, a complicated title mm -hmm. uh, because there is no country of Ruthenia. There is no specific ethnic group that is Ruthenian. And so, uh, but the history of our specific uh, Byzantine Catholic Church comes from the missionary efforts of St. Cyril and Methodius, who in the year 863 were sent by uh, Emperor Michael III from Constantinople uh, to bring Christianity to Central Europe the uh, ruler of a kingdom that was called Greater Moravia and roughly is in the area of Czech Republic, Slovakia, and Hungary, he had requested uh, that uh, Constantinople uh, send him missionaries who could teach the Christian faith in the language of the people. From neighboring uh, Germanic areas, they had attempted to bring 
uh, Christianity and had even created, built a few churches and instituted uh, a bishop who was kind of a missionary bishop. But the problem was that the people didn't understand them, firstly, because they were uh, Germanic, so not Slavs. And uh, secondly, because the way that they prayed uh, was also unintelligible to them. It was in Latin. And so, uh, but seeing the interest of his people, um, the local ruler, Rastislav, uh, petitioned Constantinople to send missionaries. So Cyril and Methodius were two brothers uh, from the city of Thessalonica in northern Greece, uh, Macedonia, was the second city of the Byzantine Empire. And, uh, and at this time, there was already a clear division between what was the Western Empire, which was the Holy Roman Empire, and then the Byzantine Eastern Roman Empire, uh, of, which was under Constantinople. Uh, the two brothers came from an area where there were already uh, Slavs who were engaged in commerce and business. And uh, so they were exposed to the Slavic language. So when they arrived, uh, Methodius had been, uh, at one time he worked for the government, but he later entered a monastery. And uh, so he was pulled out of the monastery and his brother worked in um, as the secretary and librarian of the royal court and patriarch Photius. <coughs> and so uh, both of the brothers uh, created, you could say kind of the written form of the Slavic language that they were familiar with. And they went with that to uh, the kingdom of greater Moravia and their established Christianity. From their mission, and the creation of an alphabet for the Slavic tongue, that became the foundation of the conversion of, of uh, the Slavs. So the churches such as the Russian church, the Ukrainian church, the Bulgarian church, all of them are tied to this mission. Uh, fast forward a uh, number of, well, 600, 700 years, the uh, Europe is different. Central Europe has this big empire that is called the Austro-Hungarian Empire of the Habsburg dynasty. And within this empire live the descendants of the mission of Cyril and Methodius. Because they live in a country which is predominantly Catholic, um, and it is after the Protestant Reformation, so there is a, a bit of confusion about religion. Uh, the descendants of, of the mission were, they identified as Orthodox and were in communion with the church of Constantinople. Um, and Constantinople was not in communion with Rome at this time. And uh, the patriarch of Constantinople every so many years would send a bishop into that area where he would go and he would ordain uh, men who were presented to him to the priesthood. So there was, there was a connection that was uh, with the mother church, uh, but there wasn't a connection like with uh, the Ukrainian church or the Russian church because that was another empire. It was not a part of, it was not connected to Austro-Hungary. One of the things that happened in Austro-Hungary, of course, after the Reformation was the Counter-Reformation. And that's where our uh, ancestors got caught up in that, um, that attempt to increase the number of Catholics and also to contain the spread of Protestantism. And, uh, and so because of uh, political pressure, because of the realities of living in close proximity 
to Roman Catholics because of not having a regular and normal connection with a mother church or a larger entity. Um, our churches, which in the, uh, in the Austro-Hungarian Empire were not only Slavic, but were also at this time Hungarian speaking or Romanian speaking uh, or also Serbian speaking and Croatian speaking. Um, so all of the Cath all of the Orthodox were, uh, let's say, pressured or felt the pressure to create some relationship with the Church of Rome. And so in uh, 1646, a gathering of clergy um, in the town of Ushhorod, which is today in Ukraine. Um, they gathered there and uh, created a doc document of reunification uh, with the See of Rome. And um, most of, mo there wasn't really any huge reaction to that because it did give our churches the opportunity to have our own structures, meaning eparchies or dioceses with bishops and, uh, and no longer to be uh, satellited or depending on pastoral uh, leadership and care from bishops who live very far away from Central Europe. Uh, this enabled our churches to uh, grow and this so this is the Ruthenian Catholic Church Ruthenian as a word was created for uh, to express all these different groups of Orthodox come into union with Rome within the Austro-Hungarian Empire and uh, since it is assumed uh, that Ruthenian is actually a mistake, that where we get the uh, TH in Ruthenian, that that at one time was actually should have been an SS because it was the Russian faith. So that was, since that was the most, uh, I would say probably the best known neighbor that had the same faith tradition as the Orthodox of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Uh, so Russian faith became Ruthenian and, uh, and it was promulgated that way from Rome. So the mistake happened in Rome as when it comes to the spelling. The people amongst themselves, because at this point in you know, the 17th century, uh, there is already a cultural influence in publishing of books from Russia. And so a lot of the people saw a connectedness because many of the churches spoke a Slavic language that was similar to Russian. And so they felt a connection. It was uh, the Empress uh, Maria Teresa uh, who actually created uh, the name that became uh, later Byzantine, and she named the group of these uh, Catholics in the Austro-Hungarian Empire who became, uh, who came from Orthodoxy uh, as Greek Catholics. And so that later became Byzantine Catholic. So that's, that's kind of, a, in a nutshell, the history of where we get to Byzantine Catholicism. Now it comes to this country with immigration, uh, as all of us have ancestry in other countries and places, so too the Ruthenian Catholic Church or the Byzantine Catholic Church begins with the immigration in the mid 19th century, uh, specifically to uh, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Ohio, New York, um, and the first immigrants actually came to work in the mines. Mining companies in the U.S. Uh, were sending scouts to uh, Eastern Europe. And at that time, that was still Austro-Hungary in the 19th century. 
and they uh, promised to uh, people who signed up, specifically men who signed up to go to the U.S., they promised them uh, that they would be with other people of their kind, uh, so other Slavic peoples uh, of the same or similar background, and some of the companies even promised that they would build their churches. And so, because for in Eastern Europe, village life was tied up around the church. Uh, that was the main uh, social point. Uh, the church sponsored many events. Many of the events, even you know, social events and dances, had to do with the liturgical calendar of the church. And so, like, there was a big party in the village for the patron saint of the parish church. Uh, people would be introduced, uh, you know, as potential uh, husband and wife in and around church. And so these familiar structures were then transplanted in the U.S. And so we find our oldest parishes uh, already established in the late 1800s in Pennsylvania, Ohio, and uh, New Jersey and New York. And then from there, when people started to move around, um, that's where we get parishes such as uh, my parish here in Dallas um, or the parish in Houston, but also our cathedral parish in Phoenix and, uh, and on the West Coast, uh, the parishes we have there. As people migrate after jobs, education, uh, greater opportunities. Uh, beginning after World War II, um, our church becomes a little more uh, American in identity because uh, people are starting to marry outside of the group of people who are Byzantine Catholic. And, um, and also the other event that greatly impacted uh, the history of our church here in the U.S., was the rise of the Soviet Union. Uh, since we have, we use a three-barred cross, which is uh, the same cross that is used by the Russian Orthodox Church. And it is actually, it is a cross used by uh, all the churches that have a Slavic background because it is the cross uh, with the, the arm bar and then the sign bar which is the Metropolitan Cross, and that, that is associated with the mission of St. Cyril Methodius, because St. Methodius was made Metropolitan Archbishop over the Slavs uh, in Central Europe. And then it adds on at the bottom of the cross, the foot bar, but the foot bar is slanted. And so, and that is a reminder of the cross of St. Andrew. Uh, St. Andrew the Apostle was uh, crucified on a cross that was X-shaped and so slanted bar. And uh, St. Andrew was uh, given the credit as being the only apostle, the only one of the apostles who stepped foot on land that would one day be Slavic land. And so he, uh, he is known to have preached Christianity to the Greeks who were living on the Crimean Peninsula, another hot topic place nowadays. And, uh, but today that is, uh, well, occupied Ukraine. And uh, so the connection there was, uh, you know, that was the identity of the people, that cross. Well, in the 50s, when uh, I believe it was Brezhnev was in, uh, uh, no, Khrushchev was in Pittsburgh. So he drove by, they drove him by uh, one of our Byzantine Catholic churches, St. John Chrysostom in Pittsburgh. And they have on top of their two towers, they have two crosses with the slanted bar. And Brezhnev said, uh, or Khrushchev said, look, there's a Russian cross. And that hit the media and everybody kind of freaked out because of course, you know, it was, uh, it was the period of McCarthyism. 
nobody wanted to be associated with Russia. And so that, that cross, some parishes actually changed the cross so that it wouldn't have the slanted bar. But, uh, but it was at this point also that a lot of our communities were moving away from uh, their original languages, including also old Slavonic. Slavonic being the language initially uh, created uh, by Cyril and Methodius using the Slavic tongue that they were familiar with. They wrote the liturgy that we still have, that we still celebrate occasionally. We still sing things in Old Slavonic, and that is the original translation of Cyril Methodius, you know, 1,100 years ago. And uh, so those, uh, those things started to change because of communism because our people who were here, immigrants, were worried that they would somehow be targeted because of where they came from or that they spoke a language that is similar to Russian. Um, they were worried that their children would be discriminated against. Even if their kids were born in the States, they were told, teachers were telling uh, these parents don't speak to your children in your native language because your kids will have an accent, which of course today we know that's not true. But that caused enough fear that the, our entire church began to Americanize itself. And, uh, and probably also, you know, it's not all negative. It was a good thing because as I mentioned before, there were many mixed marriages, and um, and this way, those who were married into the church, uh, they felt more comfortable. Uh, but you know, we all know that ethnicity is not only about language. Um, you know, there are food traditions. There's music, the way that people sing, sing in church. Um, the iconography, sometimes the art. You know, so uh, all of that still remains a part of our parish life and our communities, but today it's a much richer tapestry or mosaic, if you want. It's, you know, our parishes have uh, not only those who married into the church, but now we have also uh, persons who themselves have come to the Byzantine Catholic Church. They have found in the Byzantine Catholic Church uh, a community that is firmly founded on an apostolic tradition that uh, respects and draws from the teaching of the fathers of the church and their writings and spiritual guidance. And, and we count as our uh, inspiration for the journey so many wonderful saints that we celebrate, you know, joyfully on our liturgical calendar. And we know them because their life uh, speaks to us so that, you know, we identify with them. And so all these aspects of, of what is the Byzantine church, of the uh, Byzantine traditions, the, the life of the church, the way that we pray, all of this has uh, brought many converts to our parishes. And, uh, and we constantly have uh, interest that is expressed. Our communities remain smaller. And, uh, and that, is in, that is completely consistent with the way that the Byzantine church uh, expresses and celebrates its community. And um, so when we have, you know, if, if a parish like here in Dallas, so the church is full, um, if we get more people, uh, so what do we do? Well, we don't build a bigger church, we found another parish. And so, because that, that way of knowing other people and being interconnected, that's one of our strengths. And when we see people who are coming and visitors who come, 
So that's one of the things that I personally have heard from many people having served in Houston, where the Catholic Church is booming. And now here in North Texas, um, there is growth in the Roman Catholic Church. But the problem is that there hasn't been a growth in vocations. And so churches that are being built are bigger and bigger. And they have many different ministries, but because of the clergy shortage, uh, they become essentially mega churches. And so a lot of the visitors that we get here, so they're, uh, they're surprised by simple little things. For example, uh, when we distribute communion, we use the name of the person. Uh, the people know each other. You know, they pass their kids around. There's there's a connectedness. It's a it's a family gathering in a sense. And we all participate in the work of the parish, uh, whether it be simple as cleaning to, you know, greater efforts that are for the community at large, you know, such as food drives or uh, making bags for the homeless. But everyone participates in this. None of this is like farmed out. We don't hire companies to come in to, to do all of this work. It's a part of the way that we express our interconnectedness. We share in, in the work of, of uh, uh, keeping the temple and the grounds uh, beautiful um, as for us and our families, but also for our visitors, so that when people come here, they truly uh, can feel uh, the presence of God expressed in the community. I mean, yeah, we got a beautiful church and there are a lot of icons in that, but it's about the community. And, and so, and it's all, it's interconnected. This church is a reflection of the community that gathers here, that calls this their spiritual home. So um, how are we doing timeline? That, that's perfect. That was an excellent introduction. You've piqued everyone's interest because there are many questions already in the chat. I, I may not know the answers to the questions, okay. but I promise to be very interesting and creative. <laughs> that, 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 that's okay. Not, not a problem at all. Here, here's one. As a Roman Catholic, what is the proper etiquette on entering the Eastern Church and how to venerate the icons? Well, um, the proper etiquette, I mean, nobody's going to make any uh, stink about someone coming in and genuflecting. Uh, so, but the usual way that we enter, uh, our churches don't have holy water fonts. Mm -hmm. um, there, are, there is holy water in the back, but it is for, you know, to take home. Uh, it is not to bless oneself. But so you would enter, you make the sign of the cross, and you uh, bow deeply, so like at the waist. And, uh, and the best thing to do, if you don't feel comfortable with that, don't do that, watch people, <laughs> see what they do. Uh, the other thing you'll notice too is that we make the sign of the cross differently. And we cross opposite ways on the shoulders. And so, and that, that is not any big deal. You don't have to adjust the way that you make the sign of the cross. Um, you know, again, nobody is really going to be watching you. It's not something that is uh, unusual to see, uh, you know, Roman Catholic visiting. So uh, just enjoy it and ask questions. I'm sure you'll be welcomed by someone and so if you have a question, you can ask them, and, and I'm sure they'll be happy to answer you. Our communities tend to be uh, quite friendly. Hmm. Now, another question is, is the filioque said during the creed in the Byzantine Catholic Church? So in the Byzantine Catholic Ruthenian Church, it is not said. Uh, it was removed in the mid-90s, and, um, and it has been removed in, most churches to return back to the original uh, version of the creed. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, the addition of the filioque, I mean, that's a whole different topic, which 
I'm sure Michael can tell you all about. <laughs> a lot of controversy there. One of the interesting things that I bring up, because you know there are some zealous types who will come and kind of throw that at us as you know, and it's like, well, you know, come on. It's a conciliar document which you all changed. So let's you know know your history. <laughs> Secondly, the Roman Catholic Church in Greece, Roman Catholic Church, minority church, not huge because the country is primarily Greek Orthodox, but the Roman Catholic Church has removed the filioque from the mass. And they, they received permission, the bishop's conference there said, they asked Rome if that was something that they could do because on the feast of Saints Peter and Paul, when uh, there is an Orthodox presence to visit Rome on its patronal feast day, and so at the mass that is celebrated, usually the creed is sung without the filioque as a kind of in respect of the presence of Orthodox bishops or patriarchs. And so based on that, the Greek Roman Catholic Church said, wait, 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 we have also some issues with this hmm. because in Greece, that's part of what the kids learn in school. It is a way for them to also learn unique theological expressions. And so they learn the creed, they memorize the creed in the original language of Nicaea Constantinople councils. Mm -hmm. And so it's not the modern Greek, they actually learn the original version. And of course it's without the filioque. And so the, the bishops uh, in Greece were kind of like, you know, hey, this is, making it a little awkward when our kids who, you know, and the kids receive a catechism is a part of uh, education in Greek public schools. So they learn this regardless of them being Catholic or Orthodox, they still learn the same thing. So, so it's not as big of an issue. And I think anyone who wants to learn about it needs to look at the Vienna consultations that in the 90s, Rome uh, ended that negotiation um, and, and a document was produced by the Vatican about the procession of the Holy Spirit. So it's not as big of an issue as it used to be. Hmm. Thank God. <laughs> Agreed. Uh, do Byzantines think that marriage as a sacrament is given primarily by the bride and groom to one another, or that the priest is always needed as he's the one who gives the sacrament? So the um, for Byzantines, uh, the priest must bless the marriage. So there is no, we, we do differ on this, uh, the way that we understand the sacrament of marriage. Uh, so for example, even according to canon law, if uh, a Byzantine and a Roman Catholic get married, but there was no permission sought for the, uh, the Byzantine to be married in a Roman Catholic church, uh, if there isn't the blessing of a priest, if it's like a wedding done by a deacon, it's not valid. So it actually affects for the, the canonical subject. So that means people who belong sacramentally to a Byzantine Catholic parish, uh, they have to always have their marriage blessed by a priest. So then there was a related question earlier that I spotted that I thought was really interesting. And it was, if you have a Roman Catholic and an Eastern Catholic and they go to get married, could it be done by a deacon in the Latin rite? <laughs> Only with permission. It has to okay. be, that permission has to be sought. Uh, it's usually done by whoever is preparing the couple in the Roman Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. That permission has to be sought uh, through the diocese, through the okay. But it would then be valid if the permission is given. Then it would be valid. 
Okay. Okay. Um, so here's one from Alexander. If I wanted to fully embrace Eastern Catholicism and change my rights, would it be inconsistent to still use a Dewey Reams? Almost like Eastern Catholics are encouraged to pray the Jesus prayer over the rosary. So could you maybe comment um, uh, on a couple things there? The use of the Dewey Reams as an Eastern Catholic, is there a problem with using it? And then also praying the rosary. Okay. I don't think there's any problem with it. Um, I mean, we, we use a, a variety of translations anyway, and, and sometimes it, it helps to kind of keep things uh, clear. Uh, specifically for us, I think there is a connectedness to the Greek original language, and so that's where uh, referring to a few different translations becomes uh, better and richer. Also because our Liturgical tradition does make use of uh, Greek language liturgical texts. So, uh, but there, yeah, there's no problem with the use of Dewey Reims. And um, I don't know, our, uh, as, as far as, you know, Jesus prayer, so those are uh, personal devotions, mm -hmm. um, you know, differently from uh, many Roman parishes where people can, connect on Zoom or before Mass, pray the rosary together. Uh, praying the Jesus prayer together is not really a thing. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's a different form of prayer that is done uh, differently. Mm -hmm. um, I think we try to encourage uh, our parishioners to be familiar with our liturgical and spiritual tradition fully mm -hmm. because although you know like if you go if you live in an area where there are no byzantine catholics or eastern catholics you know and, and you go to a roman catholic bookstore you're not going to find a, a prayer rope right you know so thank god for amazon but <laughs> uh but it's one of those things where uh it's the rosary and novenas and booklets have been have been very accessible to many uh, Eastern Catholics. Many Eastern Catholic children have gone through Catholic schools. So there is a, a relationship with uh, the use of these different Western traditions, which is fine. But myself as a priest, so I have to also make sure that if one chooses the rosary, it is not just because it's easy or because there is easy access to it. But I want to challenge the parishioners in my parish that they, if they go to the rosary, that they choose it. But they're also aware of the akathist as a tradition and in uh, the Byzantine Church of Marian devotion or the Jesus prayer as another prayer form, you know, so it's, it's just, it's, it's just a way of balancing it out for uh, our uh, communities. It's a pastoral practice. Not, we're not like against rosaries or, mm -hmm. you know, we, because it, those are personal choices. And if that's helping you get closer to God and grow in that relationship, then use it. I think that's that's essential. Excellent. Uh, Roberto asks, if you plan on attending and later changing over to the Byzantine Catholic Church from uh, the Latin Rite, can that Byzantine Catholic Church be your parish during that time that you begin attending? Yes. Uh, we've, uh, well, it's it's been encouraged, uh, including by Pope Francis, that uh, when you when you are in that process, that you join uh, the Byzantine parish or Eastern Catholic parish, become a full member and parishioner, so that you have the time to discern, but also that you get to know the community get to know the tradition, because uh, it's not, you know, you have to grow in that relationship, not only with the parish, but with that liturgical life, with the seasons of fasting and feasting. 
it's, it would be wrong to uh, just study that but not have the, the experience because then when you come to a parish and if all your knowledge about the life of the Eastern Church is in your head, you're going to be disappointed because it, it's, it, you know, every community is different. Things uh, that are uh, the ideal are not always happening for yeah. practical reasons. You know, I mean, there's very often, uh, you know, we read texts that talk about more of a monastic cycle. And then you come to a parish and it's like, well, they're not doing it like in the monastery. Yeah, well, that's because we're not in a monastery. Mm -hmm. So, you know, so there are different realities, but uh, it is essential to become a member of that community. The other thing too, is if you are Roman Catholic and you become a parishioner in an Eastern Catholic church, then you are obligated no longer by the uh, obligations, canonical obligations, as far as like holy days of obligation of the Roman Catholic Church, but you are obligated by the holy days and the traditions of your local parish, which include fasting. And that's, I know sometimes that's bad news, but... Uh, <laughs> yeah. That's, it's, a, it's essential to have the fullness of that experience. And normally, when you then put in the request, you put in the request for the change of ritual church through the parish that you belong to. And so, an, an Eastern Catholic parish. <coughs> and you have to uh, have the endorsement of the pastor. And that's only going to happen if the pastor knows you. So mm -hmm. if you're attending for already you know, a couple of years or, you know, however long, um, you know, it's okay. The, you know, there are some parishes which they'll say, well, we're not going to endorse your change of church until you're a parishioner for three years or something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There are different requirements. And, and so it's good to talk to the priest too. So he's aware that, you know, that is your intention. Can I switch rights, even if I have trouble believing in certain theological ideas, like the essence and energies distinction of Gregory Palamas, or must I accept the Eastern theology to become Eastern? Well, you know, that's, I, I think that sometimes depends on, on, uh, with, with Palamas, so I would say, uh, continue to study because the, there is a, you get to a certain depth in Palamas where um, where the differences also are not as great. I think one of the mistakes we make is creating difference. You know, it's like, well, I believe in this, not that. And it's almost like we need to have that other side in order to prop up our uh, views. And, you know, the reality of Eastern Catholicism is that we're, we are a church in between. We're between the East and West. <coughs> we're not fully Eastern because we're in communion with the West. And, uh, and being a church in the middle means that we don't necessarily see everything as conflict. But there is, there is a relationship and a flow and ebb that we can appreciate uh, being uh, Easterners connected to the Western church. And so, uh, you know, I, I think be open. Uh, there is, um, you know, it's, it's not worth it to uh, create a certain, or live in a dichotomy that divides things uh but rather uh, you know you can have a different approach in your theological view uh, don't reject though the other side and don't become a crusader for these things because that's the last thing that the parish needs uh, you know i think i think we can appreciate being in the middle and it's not a bad place to be especially when we see the problems in the West and the problems in the East. And it's like, not too bad to be here in the middle. I see a lot of people are asking about St. Gregory Palamas. We've done a lot of shows 
on St. Gregory already. So I'm only going to ask one more that I, that I see that's, that's related. Um, so y'all, y'all ask others because we've done at least a dozen shows on Palamism and how, you know, that, um, that goes maybe with Thomism and, and things like that. So, uh, I don't, I don't really want to belabor this, but here, here's one more. March 13th is the feast of Gregory Palamas. How can someone canonized outside of communion with Rome be celebrated by Catholics? Thank you. Okay. Well, uh, St. Gregory is not celebrated by the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, however, all of the Eastern Catholic <clears throat> churches, uh, we have our own calendar of saints. And uh, the saints that were canonized prior to our union, for example, the Ruthenian Byzantine Catholic Church, our union from 1646, meaning all the saints canonized before 1646, we brought with us. And the same for like the Melkite uh, Greek Catholic Church. They also brought, I think their union is from 1724, and they brought with them all of their saints canonized prior to that year. And so, uh, so that's, and, and that's basically accepted. There isn't a dispute. Mm -hmm. We're not bringing people who are somehow, um, you know, problematic, um, you know, that they have a different approach. You know, that's kind of the history of, mm -hmm. of Christian theology. There's always going to be a different approach and someone trying to find uh, a more nuanced way of expressing a, a divine truth. And, you know, and as soon as you try to express a, a, it in a different way, then, you know, it's going to be heresy or, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. orthodoxy. So, so it's it's not Palamas is not really a part of this. He's become the uh, spokesperson in death. He's become the spokesperson uh, for many extremist theologians who like to throw around things, you know, to condemn the West, and then vice versa. Many very pious Western theologians, also extremists, mm -hmm. uh, use him to attack the East. So it's it's like we venerate him. Uh, he is venerated also the uh, in this on the second Sunday of the Great Fast of Lent. Uh, for uh, you know his teaching has become one of the cornerstones of Hesychasm, which is the uh, monastic uh, life as fully lived uh, and the understanding of prayer and how. Uh, prayer connects us to God, you know, so, so he's, he's very important for that, that part of, of our own, um, spirituality. Uh, but you know, we don't look at him for the polemics mm -hmm. and we don't throw him, you know, at the West, uh, mm -hmm. in a polemical way. I think it's, it's almost, I think it's disrespectful of, of his legacy. Because he was, he himself was not doing that in his life. That's that stuff that came from some of the other conflicts with the West, between the East and the West, and some of his later, later followers. And, and is it not the case that Rome has also approved the liturgical calendar of the Byzantine Catholic Church, thereby you know, approving his veneration in the Byzantine Catholic Church. Well, it's it's gone through a little bit of, um, I would say, uh, a colored history, mm -hmm. because in in the past, especially in F, as part of the Counter Reformation, so uh, there was a this sentiment amongst some of the uh, the Roman uh, cardinals and bishops the the people who work in the Vatican, work in the Vatican, uh, they viewed Eastern Catholics with suspicion. Mm. And, you know, because they, they're kind of a PTSD after the Reformation, you know, here are former Roman Catholics who have abandoned the church. So then they, they focused on Eastern Catholics and we're like, you know, they're just waiting for a moment so that they, they can escape, you know. And, and so the 1700s is marked by a lot of canonical visitations. Mm 
mm. which basically was Big Brother coming, you know, in the form of some cardinal functionary from the Vatican, checking the books in churches to make sure that they weren't using books that were, you know, printed by the Orthodox or that they didn't have special veneration of some of the uh, schismatic saints, you know. So it, it's had a colorful history. And then in with Vatican I and Vatican II, so all of this has become kind of cleared up. Mm -hmm. So because that that's it. So it there is a history, but um, you know I think we're at a good place now. Thank God. Michael Schumann asks, "How long might I have to attend a Byzantine parish before my three-year-old son can be chrismated?" Uh, well, that's for you to speak with the priest specifically. Mm -hmm. That's that's something, and uh, and he would be chrismated and receive communion at the same time, because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. there there isn't you can't just you can't separate them out. Mm -hmm. um, Mike asks, has Father seen an uptick in new parishioners since COVID? Well, I've only been here uh, since August, so uh, I can say for my previous parish in Houston that uh, we, we, had, we had an uptick of sorts, uh, but specifically we had a lot of people uh, connecting and following faithfully uh, live stream services. And a lot of people who were not our parishioners originally. So, so we, we had both a growth as far as numbers in the church uh, but there was a growth. And, and the interesting thing, too, is that our parish in Houston did not suffer any of the financial issues that other uh, churches did. So people were actually sending in donations, uh, you know, even though they weren't coming physically to the church. Um, but so that it's, it's an interesting uh, dynamic i can't wait for COVID to be over to kind of analyze all this in hindsight because it's, mm. it's a it's going to be a different pastoral ministry you know i think many of these things which we've discovered through COVID uh, are going to become a regular part of uh, parish and pastoral life can Father Elias talk about the rite of exorcism in the Byzantine Church? It, is there a difference between the Western rite versus the Eastern rite? Who performs the exorcism, and do they use Greek? Oh well, I mean that's I, I'm not really familiar with the Western rite. I believe in the Roman Church, exorcists are appointed mm -hmm. by the bishop. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't have that tradition. Every priest is. Uh, enabled by virtue of his ordination to perform exorcisms according to uh, to the need, but also um, <laughs> exorcisms are a part of uh, the mystery, the sacrament of baptism. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, that's, that's pretty much all I could really say to it specifically. Mm -hmm. Is there a particular ritual or text that's used or is it more informal? Um, well, I've, I've only had like in 20 years, two exorcisms and they had to do with, uh, not demonic possession, but like a, a presence that, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, caused problems in the homes where, where they were. Uh, and so there are prayers that are prescribed. Uh, but it, it was also based on the anointing and blessing of the house. Mm. So that was the, the, like the first thing to do with then uh, prayers that, uh, like I used also the prayers for peaceful repose because it, it was kind of presupposed that the presence was of someone who had passed away. Mm. Mm. So in, and in one case, we knew that the, the homes that were there were built on uh, Indian burial ground. So, mm -hmm. so that's that's kind of the extent of it. I haven't had the experience of you know uh, doing an exorcism for like demonic possession, 
Mm -hmm. uh, but there are there are very specific prayers for that. Mm -hmm. And 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 no, we don't use Greek. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This one is from Jake. Is there an annulment system in the Eastern Catholic Churches, uh, or is the annulment system in the Eastern Catholic Churches a Latinization? If so, are the orth Orthodox valid in their view of ecclesiastical divorce? Oh, boy, this is a doozy. <laughs> uh, so, yes, we have adopted the annulment system similarly to as it's done in the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, Interestingly enough, the um, the way that divorce occurs uh, in the Orthodox Church, so only the first uh, marriage is considered fully sacramental. And so a divorce is a church ecclesiastical divorce is granted, but a second marriage is done as a penitential service and and so it is granted based on the fact that uh, we are sinners and imperfect so uh, it's done as a uh, convention to uh, the the human condition uh, and it's it's similar you know I, I would compare it because since we don't have something like that in uh, in the Catholic Church or in the Eastern Catholic Churches at this point, since we have started to use, uh, well, we've been using the annulment process. I would compare it to uh, when a priest is laicized. And so uh, he is still a priest. The, sac the character of a sacramental character of ordination remains with him, but he is then permitted to like get married. You know, so it's it's kind of you know that would be the closest comparison. So that first wedding in the Orthodox Church between two Orthodox is sacramentally valid. Now the uh, if the Orthodox couple or one of the couple wanted to then marry in the Catholic Church, then they would need to seek an annulment through the Catholic Church, hmm. the same way that it's done for like Protestants who have married. So, but it's that as far as the, you know, the discipline or how it's done, it's not that different if you compare it to a priest being laicized. But, you know, obviously there is a, a, a comparison between the, the Roman Catholic or the Catholic practice and the Orthodox practice for annulment versus divorce. We're going to take two more chat questions and then I'm going to open up the phone lines. Nathan Howe asks, do most Eastern Catholics in the United States keep the Latin date of Easter or the date most Orthodox keep? So I would say most Eastern Catholics in the U.S. do keep the Western date of Easter. Uh, with the exception of the Ukrainian Catholic Church. The Ukrainian Catholic Church keeps the, uh, uh, the Julian date, but they also celebrate uh, uh, not all parishes, some parishes um, celebrate also Christmas on January 7th. So they keep the Julian calendar as that is the calendar of their mother church in Ukraine. Uh, and uh, and again, going back to the uh, Roman Catholic Church in Greece, the Roman Catholic Church in Greece actually keeps the Orthodox date of Easter. So it's kind of a interesting little uh, tidbit of trivia. Hmm. All right, one more chat uh, question. So y'all go ahead and start calling. I can only take one call at a time, y'all, and then I can have one on call waiting. So, <laughs> um, if if you if you see that we have a call on the line, you maybe just kind of hold off until the call's over. Uh, but the number is one eight hundred four eight four three eight zero one. In fact, I'll put it here on the screen in just a second. Um, so, what are your recommendations for learning about the lives of Eastern saints? Is there a cutoff point for Eastern saints post schism? The often the recluse Herman Alaska. Well, um, so the cutoff point, that kind of depends because 
although we may not have the saints added to our official liturgical calendar, our calendar where they are celebrated liturgically and remembered, um, amongst the faithful there is awareness and veneration of different Orthodox saints. And, and that's more of, a, again, that would fall under personal piety. Uh, I myself, I'm very uh, devoted to St. Nectarios of Egina. Uh, was a kind of a like a Saint Nicholas figure, and uh, and his his life is remarkable. Actually, uh, on March twenty first, I believe so, uh, they're going to uh, show the film that was made in Greece about his life. It's supposed to be released for one day only in the U.S. So, but you can look look it up. I believe it's called Man of God, mm. uh, but. So, th but that's, that is a uh, personal devotion. Similarly, in our parishes, very often we have veneration of like some of the more recent uh, icons, miraculous icons, like from Russia or Serbia or Greece, uh, things that have happened after our reunification with Rome. Uh, so that, that's a gray area as far as the, the veneration is, is concerned. Um, I think to uh, learn about the lives, and there, there is a lot of information that can be found online. Uh, many, uh, it's excellent way of learning about saints is by specific, specifically the fathers. The fathers of the desert read their writings. Um, it's, it's not, uh, and and you, we don't have to be scrupulous also about the text that we read. Um, the many Orthodox publications and books are wonderful. And so we don't need to have like a, you know, uh, a Catholic. It's not going to have uh, heresy. There are books that are polemical that, you know, seek to kind of, uh, those are books we really shouldn't engage in. Mm -hmm. But uh, but as far as, you know, you pick up a book that's about the life of uh, St. Theophan or, mm -hmm. or, you know, or any of the fathers and by an Orthodox author, I, I almost can guarantee it will be very good and completely sound. Mm -hmm. Y'all go ahead and uh, go call. It's 1-800-484-3801. It is there at the bottom of your screen, 1-800-484-3801. We'll take one more chat question here in the meantime while y'all are calling. Uh, was Father raised Byzantine Catholic? And if not, why did he choose the Ruthenian rite instead of any other Byzantine rite? Uh, well, my my father is uh, Ruthenian. And so I was raised actually, uh, grew up in the Roman church essentially, uh, but we went occasionally to the Ukrainian church and I, um, I got very involved in the Ukrainian church as a server, uh, when I was, uh, uh, 11, 12 years old and then, uh, joined the Ukrainian, uh, youth group. I mean, that, that became my parish for, uh, most of my adolescence. All right. I get, looks like we got a call here. Caller, you're live with Reason in Theology. Uh, what, what's your question for Father? Yes, I have two quick questions. Uh, in the Eastern Orthodox, uh, incorporate the, the rosary along with the prayer rope, and I guess vice versa. And the second question is about uh, Orthodox, like saints, who Eastern Catholics venerate all of the Orthodox. So, like, for instance, St. Sarah from the rope. Mm -hmm. If I'm pronouncing them correct, that's right. Thank mm -hmm. you. Okay, yeah, Father, you want to take a stab at that? Well, I, we can use rosaries to pray the Jesus prayer. You know, the, the the prayer rope is not as structured. It's just a, a beads or knots in a rope that are used to uh, busy the fingers. So they're not. It's not really keeping count per se. Uh, but we can use a rosary to say the Jesus prayer too. Uh, there, you know, there, there is, um, and as I said before, there's nothing wrong with, with, uh, using a rosary to pray the rosary. You know, that's a, it's a wonderful, uh, 
spiritual tradition and prayer that that has borne much fruit for uh, many Catholics. And we'll find that also amongst uh, Eastern Orthodox and an Oriental Orthodox too, specifically from areas where there is overlap between uh, Catholicism and Orthodoxy. So for example, uh, many of my friends uh, in Lebanon uh, who are Eastern Orthodox or Armenian Orthodox uh, pray the rosary because they have found in it uh, a beautiful prayer that has enhanced their uh, relationship with God and made them uh, more spiritually, uh, well, nourish them more spiritually. Uh, so that's not unusual. In, in other places, I mean, if you go to a country which is... Uh, exclusively Orthodox, you may find that the awareness of like the rosary, but even the understanding of, you know, what Catholicism is, is very, uh, uh, well, misinformation seems to be the norm. <coughs> so areas, a lot of that, you could, we could call that kind of a grassroots ecumenism, but it happens, you know, and it, and it happens also in families that are mixed. So you'll see this kind of uh, uh, ebb and flow of, of spiritual traditions that people use organically to, uh, to pray. So, so it's not unusual. And it, <coughs> in regards to the, the Orthodox saints, again, uh, although they're not added specifically to the liturgical calendar of the Eastern Catholic churches, uh, many, many parishes have a uh, deep veneration for like St. Seraphim of Sato. We love him. And, and, you know, and like I mentioned also St. Nectarios, um, you know, you'll find in some of our parishes, you'll find them on the walls. So it's almost, you know, and, and a part of it we could say is, uh, also our desire to be in, communion with uh, the Orthodox Church. And so that veneration of these different saints and their, uh, and the, the miracles worked, you know, because uh, St. Nectarios in both my parish in Houston, as well as my previous assignment in Pittsburgh, I had received the oil from the uh, lamps hanging over his tomb and have anointed people with it, you know, who had cancer and the miracles just you know, they really blew my mind, you know, so, so it, it's, it's, that's the one thing when, you know, talk about a communion of saints, uh, I think it's a bigger communion than, than we think, because the, the division is of our own production, you know, we yeah. are the ones who have created and maintained the division between orthodoxy and Catholicism, and, uh, but, in God, there isn't that division. And so, you know, the, the saints are, uh, they are uh, living a fuller, richer, more perfect reality than what we have here. Kali, you're live with Reason and Theology. What's your question for Father Elias? Hi, I'm Michael. Hi, uh, Father Elias. Um, Michael Schumann here. Um, can you hear me? Yeah, we can. Hear yes. You. Okay. Okay. Uh, my question is, I've been really uh, feeling very drawn to the Byzantine rite, and uh, is there anything you would recommend uh, as, as helpful things to discern whether one is called to do that, to go that direction? Well, um, are you close to a parish? Yeah, I mean, uh, twenty-five minutes, so. Well, th I think that's the first thing is to connect directly to a parish, uh, then incorporate within your own prayer life, um, you know, the, the traditions of the Byzantine church in some way, be it prayers or daily prayers, just to have that experience. Um, I think the, the other, uh, there are many different things that are produced uh, as far as written materials. Uh, God With Us Publications 
is the uh, publishing arm of the uh, Eastern Catholic bishops of the U.S. And so different from the Roman Catholic Church publishes technically very little. Most of its publications are done by companies that are owned by religious orders like Liguri Press or Ignatius Press or, you know, so it's not actually being published by the bishops. Our bishops about 35 years ago made a decision that they were not going to permit the publications of our educational and catechetical materials by other entities. And so we would do it ourselves. And so the, uh, the Association of Eastern Catholic uh, Eparchial Directors of Religious Education became the, the unit that produced these different texts. And uh, so they have a website. And uh, so just look for God with us publications. And it should be right there uh, on there that it is, uh, you know, Eastern Catholic associates, Eastern Catholic bishops. And they did things that are very helpful. There are books that talk about different topics. And, and I believe right now there's actually a bunch of materials that they are giving away that you can order and just pay for the shipping because uh, they had a lot of overhead of published books. You know, you have to buy, uh, if, to make printing cost effective, you have to print in large numbers. And so they had a little bit too many. And so that's a good way of getting some excellent texts. And there are introductory texts like this, which I use this for people who are coming to, uh, are inquiring about our church. Uh, and it comes, so this is our faith, our worship, and our path. And so it's a, and these are very nicely done uh, books that are introductions to different topics that are part of our reality as, uh, as Eastern Catholics. And uh, so these are also available there. Uh, so it's, I think, pray, participate, you know, connect to a parish, uh, read, and listen. You know, there are a lot of uh, podcasts out there. There are a lot of, uh, there are a lot of people you can interact with directly that can uh, inform your decisions as you go. Caller, you're live with Reason and Theology. What's your question for Father Elias? Uh, Father Elias, I, um, Appreciate the talk. I had a weird question, maybe a little off topic from some of the other ones. Is, do you think it will ever be a possibility that the Ruthenian Catholic Church in the United States would be able to elect its own uh, bishops and point its own bishops in a, uh, like a fully autonomous way, similar to maybe like OCA and other Orthodox jurisdictions have done? Well, that, yeah, that, that is something that we're all kind of asking ourselves when that's going to happen. In... Um, we have had a lot of autonomy in presenting the candidates, uh, but it's still, it's more along the lines of kind of a limited participation. And, uh, and so they're not necessarily, it's, it's definitely not the way that it is done in the OCA or in other churches. Uh, I would hope that the trend, at least with uh, under the pontificate of Pope Francis, has been uh, greater autonomy for the Eastern Catholic churches. And so I'm hopeful that that will, in the long term, bear fruit, because um, the election of bishops should be uh, should come from within the church community and not only represent the opinion of the clergy, the priests who are serving, but also the deacons and the laity. And so that, that process is uh, one that is hoped for by many of us. Um, and some were asking for clarification. Could you repeat the publication uh, that you recommended earlier? 
the uh the publication just google god with us publications mm -hmm. and I that's the, they the should website. pop up right away yeah yeah it should it looks like it's god with us books.org uh Kali, you're live with reason and theology what's your question for father elias hello father um my name is Dow. I am a Latin seminarian. I was wondering, um, the, uh, what are you? I was wondering if, um, what are the, the how do Latin Catholics fulfill their Sunday obligations in the Byzantine Church? Like, is it only through the divine liturgy, Vespers with communion, typical, and stuff like that? like that, for example. I'm not really sure when my obligation is for, is fulfilled. Okay, well, according according to the uh, to Eastern Canon Law, so um, the fulfillment of the obligation is pretty much it is by going to church. So participation in, uh, and we don't have like a specific time requirement where you have to be at the liturgy, you know, from this point of the liturgy to that point. Uh, so it is it is enough time that one could go and get some candles, kiss a few icons and uh, light the candles. I mean, that's a minimum that that is there. Uh, the uh, the reason why it's not so specific, like in the Roman Catholic Church, it's much more specific. The reason why it's not so specific is because we still have a significant number of uh, faithful from different Eastern Catholic churches who live in uh, especially the Middle East, where uh, fulfilling their sub Sunday obligation is not something necessarily possible for them, especially if they are working or they are living in an area where there is no Christian presence or church. And so in order not to burden them with, uh, with requirements that they would not fulfill, it was decided that the, the legal expression would remain uh, rather uh, ample and give more space for interpretation and fulfillment. Uh, as far as with Roman Catholics attending, so if a Roman Catholic is a member of a community that is like a Byzantine mission or a, uh, or a parish, the um, obligation is, you know, whatever the weekend services are. So if there is no priest and there is typica with a deacon, which is uh, uh, liturgy of the word with communion, essentially, uh, that does fulfill the obligation. If there is in that community, for example, a weekend where there is no priest whatsoever and there is only reader-led vespers, that fulfills the obligation. So, uh, so if a Roman Catholic belongs to a community like that, the obligation is fulfilled that way. But if you are a visitor, then you have to follow the uh, what the uh, Roman Catholic Church prescribes. So, for example, if you come to um, you know come to my parish and and you attend vespers on Saturday evening, uh, that technically would not fulfill your obligation. If you would attend the liturgy, then that would fulfill your obligation. So you're urged to follow the practice of the church that you belong to as a parishioner not not canonically because like i said we do have many people who uh, belong and have belonged for years if not decades to byzantine catholic churches and canonically they're still roman catholic but they're they are faithfully integrated into a byzantine catholic parish and they are for all intents and purposes byzantine we have time for one more question. We have Dr. Brian Butcher coming on in 20 minutes. He's an Eastern Catholic theologian, Ukrainian uh, Catholic subdeacon, actually, and he's going to be coming on to discuss Eastern Catholic theology, what it is or what is it, oh, how do you do it, all that good stuff. So he's coming on in 20 minutes, but we have time for one more caller. 
Father Elias is ready to take your question. Caller, are you able to hear us? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? Yeah, and what, yes. what's your question for Father Elias? Are Eastern Catholic churches governed by the Roman Rite Congregation, and is the code of canons they use written in Latin what would be required of Orthodox churches to assent to if they return to union with Rome? Good question. Yeah. So, well, as far as, I mean, the, the churches are sui iuris uh, for the most part. Eastern Catholic churches are self-governing. So uh, we do have, uh, we do ascribe to uh, the code of Eastern canon law, uh, which I believe was, may have been written in Latin. I don't know. I, I have it in Italian. So um, <laughs> most of these things are translated into whatever useful language is needed. Uh, we do have uh, the Eastern uh, congregation, the Congregation for Oriental Churches, uh, is a body that is kind of between the Eastern Catholic Churches and the Vatican. And so, uh, for example, like with the uh, appointment of bishops, so where there is a conversation with the individual uh, Eastern Catholic Church, it'll go through the Oriental Congregation. So they, they, at one time they were, they had more, they were big brother. They were the supervisory body. Now they're kind of the in-between. And so they help out with, you know, things that might need to go to the Vatican. Like for example, there are things that we don't need to do with the Vatican. So we just inform them. Like we, the translation of the divine liturgy into English, uh, the last translation, it was done, approved by the bishops, and sent to Rome. And that was only done as kind of in consultation. Um, so it wasn't, we didn't require their approval. And, um, and, you know, we got comments. They passed it on to uh, noted Byzantine liturgy experts who then, you know, made annotations for things that uh, could be uh, changed or, you know, provide an alternate uh, translation. But, um, yeah, so that relationship, it's a kind of a, a free flow relationship. And there are some things which uh, they uh, do or are responsible for in other aspects of our existence that they are not. You mentioned their joint efforts uh, among the bishops. In the United States, is there a synod of, of Eastern Catholic bishops or specifically Byzantine Catholic bishops? There is. in Well, every Eastern Catholic church that has more bishops in this country has its own uh, body of bishops. So uh, the Byzantine Ruthenian Catholic Church has a council of hierarchs mm -hmm. for all the Ruthenian bishops together, and they meet. They meet, I think, about uh, now with COVID. I have no idea, but uh, mm -hmm. but they used to meet about three or four times a year, mm -hmm. and they would work through things like you know the liturgical commission and and the promulgation of texts or you know <clears throat> new things that needed to come out. So they have some responsibilities that they take care of. The Ukrainians would have a similar structure uh, as a metropolitan church in this country. However, they're under the bigger Ukrainian Catholic Church. So they have a synod back in uh, Ukraine around uh, their uh, patriarch, major archbishop. Uh, for us, since we don't have a mother church, so that's why we have a council of hierarchs that gathers together, because we don't have to refer to a church in Europe. Mm -hmm. And uh, the other question was about... Uh, the reunification with the Orthodox. There's nothing in canon law that is specifically about that. I think that's that's not talked about in order to not be offensive, because I think that uh, the relationship with the Orthodox churches is developing. And with some churches, it is better than with others. 
And so to somehow enshrine certain concepts in canon law may only serve for it to become an, a bigger stumbling block to reunification. Last question, and it's a personal question. I'm just curious, how many languages do you speak, Father? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh there's a few. <laughs> uh, I've, I've heard several already from you. So, and you just mentioned Italian, too. So I'm just thinking, wow, how many languages? Well, I, I went to the seminary in Italy. So that's, that's oh. the, I think you saw one of the. the uh, yeah, I saw that one. The rector yeah. shared yeah. it. Yeah. Like, rector is uh, Texan, Benedictine. And so he shared the link to to this uh, uh, webinar. So yeah, <laughs> yeah, that, that's that's impressive, Father. Thank you so much for coming on and doing this. Put in a plug for your parish and anything else that you want the viewers and listeners to be made aware of. Yeah, just go. You can Google our parish, Saint Basil the Great, in Irving, Texas. We have a very nice website. We are live streaming also. Uh, we have a Facebook page, um, St. Basil's in Irving. And, uh, and if you have any questions, just you can send a message either through Facebook or through our parish website, and, uh, and I'll get back to you as soon as I can. And may we have your blessing, Father. Yes. May the Lord God bless you and keep you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for coming on, Father. This was on My truly pleasure. an honor. And everybody, thank y'all for watching. Don't forget to subscribe to this channel if you haven't already. Also, check us out, patreon.com forward slash reason and theology if you want to support us. And we're going live in 10 more minutes here with, again, Dr. Brian Butcher on Eastern Catholic Theology. So y'all y'all uh, stick around and uh, stay tuned for that. We'll see y'all later. God bless. If you're looking to buy or sell a home, office, or any kind of property anywhere in the world, you're going to want to call Real Estate for Life, and they're going to connect you with a Catholic agent. Now, that agent will donate a portion of their commission upon sale, and Real Estate for Life will donate 75% of that gift to a pro-life organization at no cost to you. Call Real Estate for Life at 1-877-LIFE-US1 or text them 248-431-1440. If you care about the pro-life cause, call them now.